I'm Liz Faubles and this is Currents. When it comes to marriage, preparation is key. We have to take this seriously. If we don't do proper marriage preparation, when these couples get to Psalm 22 moments in their lives, they're going to have nothing to draw from. Plus, a divorce expo is happening in New York this weekend, but is it the best thing for relationships on the rocks? It's unfortunately a misunderstanding of what marriage is as a covenant. It's not a contract that we can break and change. And cutting through the media noise for the truth about matrimony. God made us to love. He made us out of love, and we're here to love each other, and we should find that in marriage. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Well, spring is here and temperatures are slowly warming up and with it, we're seeing some spring showers. But when we talk about showers in the spring, it's not just about the weather. Many couples out there are preparing for their wedding showers. According to one report, 29% of weddings occur in the spring and 35% in the summer. And it's easy to get caught up in the material preparation that goes into the special day, making up the giftlets, deciding where to have the reception and who to invite, but there is another Another arguably more important preparation that takes place and one that leads to a true understanding of what marriage really is. Well, earlier this year, the Church of Catherine of Siena in Manhattan allowed men and women to further explore that. The church hosted a speaker recognized as an expert on the Catholic understanding of marriage. The reason why you're here is you believe with all your heart and with all your soul that the person sitting next to you is the person that God placed in your life to help you get to heaven. We live in a culture today that says that, uh, you know, marriage is like a contract. It's like an agreement between two people. And what God is trying to do is establish a covenant. So it's as that marriage unfolds, it's about being made more and more into the image and likeness of God instead of creating God in our own image and likeness, which is happening in our culture today. And so it's not just a matter of practicing, it's always remembering what that marriage is rooted in, especially for us as Catholics. Jesus is the heart, the center, the focus. And so therefore the Eucharist, prayer, those things must be at the core of the marriage covenant or else it's not going to survive. We decided to do this so that we can really highlight marriage between a man and a woman marriage for the sharing of love and the procreation of children as the privileged and singular place within society to assure the future of the society. We have to take this seriously. If we don't do proper marriage preparation, when these couples get to Psalm 22 moments in their lives, they're going to have nothing to draw from. Uh, I'm basically trying to, you know, uh, help these couples to make a connection between the faith and their married life. So that, again, the marriage becomes just a part of who they are. The faith becomes an important integral component of who they are and how they're living their married life and not just something perfunctory that they do at Christmas and Easter or whenever the relatives are in town. That the faith really becomes uh, lived out. Because remember, we're talking about they're helping to build future generations of the church. And the stronger we lay that foundation, the stronger the church is going to be in moving into the future. The deacon mentioned a statistic, 51% of marriages end in divorce. Um, and so I think a lot of the issues that he's touching upon, the state of marriage uh, is not good. People are getting married for, you know, they don't know the reasons they're getting married. They, they're, they're, they're getting married because they're in love and they're not sort of thinking through what marriage actually means and, and sort of the commitment, um, covenant aspect of it. We're always challenged in our faith. And it's really good to get basically information, educational tools to help us sort of, in a sense, evangelize, but also to reinforce what we need to do to build the foundation for a really great, strong marriage. Now, it's going to take work. It's not always going to be easy. But they need to know that from their wedding day until death, that they have God's grace to get them through the most difficult times and the toughest challenges. Because with God, all things are possible. 
and we will have more on this later in the show. An expo in New York this week looks to show people that breaking up may not be so hard to do. We'll get Bishop DeMarcio's thoughts on that. We'll also cut through the often rocky world of celebrity marriages and breakups to paint a clearer picture of the sacrament of matrimony. But stay tuned. There's more current straight ahead after the Pope's trip. Is it business as usual in Cuba? We'll find out and get the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. Coming up later, understanding the true meaning of marriage. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. With Pope Benedict safely back at the Vatican, hundreds of Cuban dissidents detained during his visit have been released. The dissidents were either jailed or placed under house arrest the week of the Pope's visit to stop them from attending any of the religious activities surrounding the visit. And that's according to Christian Solidarity Worldwide. As many as 38 detainees were imprisoned in their hometown of Olguin, where some of the main activities surrounding Benedict's visit took place. CSW reports there were no Bibles allowed in the cells and dissidents say they they were housed near violent criminals. Many of the protesters passed the time by fasting and praying that no one else would have to suffer like this just for the speaking of truth. Some dissidents did manage to attend the Holy Father's Mass in Havana and remain hopeful. Oswaldo Paya, a peaceful dissident and global director of the Christian Liberation Movement, said Cubans have, quote, opened our hearts to hope. After attending the Mass, Pope Benedict XVI celebrated in Havana. Paya denounced the arrests made by the Cuban government to prevent dissidents from participating in Pope Benedict XVI's historic visit to the country. And just days after Pope Benedict XVI left Mexico, signs of religious reform. According to the Associated Press, Mexico's Senate overwhelmingly approved a constitutional reform guaranteeing people the right to celebrate religious events in public. There is one caveat, though. They must not engage in electoral politics. Now, bear in mind, public religious observance is a sensitive issue in Mexico. Back in the 20s, harsh anti-clerical laws sparked an uprising by Roman Catholics against the secular government. Some critics did weigh in, saying that the change could allow religion into public schools and public affairs. It's not a done deal yet, though. At least 16 of Mexico's 31 state legislatures must still approve this reform. Well, after a bit of a break, the next primary battle is just around the corner. And according to one poll, victory is in hand for Mitt Romney. According to an NBC Marist poll, 40% of likely primary voters support Romney. Santorum is about seven points behind at 33%. This week, Romney received the endorsements of Wisconsin Congressman Paul Ryan, Florida Senator Marco Rubio, and former President George H.W. Bush. Wisconsin, meanwhile, was the scene last year of a bruising battle over unions' rights. The state legislature eventually passed a measure that took away most collective bargaining rights for state workers. Wisconsin's bishops did not take sides on the overall budget, but everyone to consider things in terms of their impact on the common good. It was announced today that Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, who proposed the legislation on state workers, will face a recall election in the spring. The state's lieutenant governor will also face a recall. Paul Volt. Now from California, the state's highest court has refused to reinstate a lawsuit bought by six brothers who say a priest abused them in the 1970s. California Supreme Court ruled 5-2 to two that the brothers waited too long to come forward. The priest retired in 1993 after similar allegations were brought against him. He died in 2010. And after an R rating that attracted national attention, Bully, a new documentary premiering today in New York and Los Angeles, will be released with no rating. This gives theater owners the choice of screening the film or not. Now, the decision follows a failed effort to have the MPAA rating changed from R to PG-13. The initial R rating, which was issued because of language, meant the film would find difficulty being screened in U.S. high schools or middle schools, and that's the documentary's target audience. Director Lee Hirsch said the small amount of language in the film that's responsible for the R rating is there because it's, quote, real. Earlier this month, we spoke with Eileen Dwyer, executive director for the Program for the Development of Human Potential, about the importance of the movie ahead of the MPAA decision to rescind this R rating and talked about how Catholic schools are tackling the bullying issue. The current state of bullying in our Catholic schools reflects the current state of bullying everywhere. Um, the the things that the 
Catholic schools have an advantage over is the fact that they're also doing things called emotional literacy, where we're asking children to be able to name their feelings, talk about their feelings, and build a sense of empathy. And Eileen also stressed the importance of the documentary subject matter. I think it's a subject matter that is extremely important for our students and our families, parents, to, uh, to get a handle on and understand. Uh, every other day we're reading in the paper that some child commits suicide, and uh, when they do some investigation, they find that the child has been bullied. So it is a very serious problem. It is not a new problem, but one that uh, continues to escalate. Um, the fact that they followed these students over a period of time uh, and that these, it is a documentary, uh, are real-life stories. They're not just, you know, fictional, made-for-TV movies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's very, very important. Elsewhere, social networking has its benefits. They reunite old friends, classmates, long-lost relatives, and thanks to a new social network site, can also connect military families. Allie Campbell came up with the idea while her Marine boyfriend was deployed. She wanted to connect with other military wives or girlfriends who could relate to her. Well, the site works a lot like Facebook and has attracted thousands of visitors from around the world since Campbell launched it less than two months ago. And Campbell says her effort was part of a much larger desire on her part. I was sitting in church one day and the priest was talking about the greater good and how you need to, um, you can't be successful but you just need to do something that um, helps other people. And it was, that, it was as if someone walked by and dropped this idea into my head. And Campbell says the site is for parents, siblings, or anyone who loves a U.S. service member. It's called CamoConnect.com. Camo, C-A-M-O, is short for connecting all military others. An Iraqi archbishop is urging Christians in his country to celebrate Easter without fear. Kirkuk Archbishop Louis Sacco tells Asia News that Lent is a time to reflect on our faith and not shut off from the world. Violence over the last 10 years has driven out half of the Christian population of Iraq. The archbishop says Muslims have expressed support for Iraqi Christians. And bishops in the Philippines are calling on Islamists and communist rebels to observe a ceasefire during Holy Week. At least two bishops there point to the fact that Lent is a time of reconciliation, with one bishop calling it a safe season. Both the government and communist rebels said last week that there would not be ceasefire. The battle over the death penalty must continue. That's what Archbishop Joseph Mitsuaki Takami of Nagasaki, Japan, told Asia News. His comments followed a recent decision by Japan's justice minister to uphold three death sentences. The three death row inmates, all convicted of multiple crimes, were executed on Thursday. Archbishop Takami added, it not only, it's not only about philosophical or religious arguments, but that we must consider the fact that imposing the death penalty entails the most demanding decision decision a man can take. The Archbishop told Asia News all Japanese bishops are for the abolition of the death penalty. Now the city's justice minister noted that 80 percent of the Japanese public supports capital punishment, although hangings have always proved to be controversial in that country. The last executions in the country occurred almost two years ago. And a Vatican Archbishop released a message for the Fifth World Autism Day. The head of the Pontifical Council for Healthcare Workers says there needs to be sensitivity and support for autistic people and their families. The Archbishop says the church must do its part to support all who are affected by autism. Now, according to data from the Centers for Disease Control, one in 88 American children have some form of autism, an increase of almost 80 percent from 10 years ago. Among children with the disorder, boys outnumber girls five to one. And the Vatican has approved a new blessing for children in the womb. The Vatican has approved the blessing to be published in English and Spanish. The U.S. Bishops' Conference had already given its approval back in 2008. According to Catholic News Service, the prayer can be used at Mass, outside of Mass, and for an individual mother, couple, or group of expectant parents. Well, stay tuned. There's more Currents Ahead. Just ahead, an event in New York has all you need to get a divorce. We'll get Bishop DeMarcio's thoughts on that. Family is the, the basic uh, building block of society. And, and because we've uh, lost some of the understanding of the family, uh, this is why marriage is in, is in bad shape.
Welcome back. This weekend, New York City will be the site of an event that will give people the ins and outs of breaking up. It's an expo all about divorce. Titled Start Over Smart, a modern divorce expo, the event will feature experts covering all aspects of divorce, from the legal, financial, child psychology fields, just to name a few. And if numbers are anything to go by, the expo should get a big turnout. Depending on who you quote, anywhere from 41% to 50% of first marriages in the U.S. end in divorce. Now, the Catholic Church, of course, does not allow divorce, so how would it view a divorce expo? It's the subject of this week's Into the Deep. Brooklyn Bishop Nicholas DiMarcio sat down with our news director, Ed Wilkinson. Bishop, thanks for being with it's us. Good to be here. I guess it's a sign of the times that New York is hosting a divorce expo. I mean, <laughs> never, we never thought we'd see something like that. We see marriage expos. Uh, what's going on in our society that all of a sudden we talk about divorce so readily like well, this? Well, what's going on is that half of the marriages do end in divorce. So it's obviously something very common. Uh, there's even certain things, people that celebrate divorces. So um, it, it's unfortunately a misunderstanding of what marriage is as a covenant. It's not a contract that we can break and change. Mm -hmm. So th there's, a, there's a misunderstanding and certainly about the sacramentality of marriage. And then for those who are not Catholic, uh, an understanding of what this commitment to marriage is about. Yeah. Why does the church in, uh, interpret marriage as being a lifetime commitment? Well, I mean, why not just a five or ten year contract with somebody? <laughs> uh, well, again, uh, we, we look to the history of, of our faith uh, bef bef prior to uh, Christ and Certainly Christ's injunctions are pretty clear uh, that the marriage is uh, for forever. It's for, for, for keeps. And uh, th this is uh, where we, we come from. And look at the history of the last 2,000 years. As the sacramental understanding of marriage grew in the, in the life of the church, um, the covenant relationship was even more important than it was perhaps in the beginning where it looked like a natural relationship uh, was being blessed by the church, but really uh, it's seen now as a uh, supernatural relationship uh, with in Christ that two people as Catholics enter into a, a marriage covenant. And th this is a really the best understanding of marriage that we have. Sure. And really, uh, marriage and the family has become a, a staple of our current society. Our society is built on it, isn't, isn't it? Ma family is the the basic uh, building block of society. And, and because we've uh, lost some of the understanding of the family, uh, this is why marriage is in, is in bad shape. Mm -hmm. uh, many people talk about, well, the, what does the church do? Well, we have our pre canon classes that are supposed to help people prepare for marriage. Unfortunately, most people already have made their mind up about getting married, no matter what we say, <laughs> no matter how they do it. But really, the preparation for marriage happens in the family. Mm -hmm. uh, most people will imitate the relationship that they see their parents have with one another when they get married themselves. No matter what you do, this is what the pattern they learn, mm -hmm. good and bad, unfortunately. So th that beginning of uh, preparation for marriage takes place in the home mm -hmm. uh, as a per person is growing in the home. So that's why it's important to strengthen our families because we're going to have weaker and weaker families and less and less uh, stable uh, marriages yeah. unless we can teach families how to, to be uh, loving and concerned for one another. Yeah. What can, we, what can the church do as a church to encourage stable marriages? So like you say, uh, you know, people who are married uh, 20, 25 years, they still need that uh, to be reinforced because uh, that's what younger people yeah. are going to well, learn. I think as we are, many parishes do programs that are to strengthen families usually through involving the children, uh, but anything we could do to help the family deal with the issues that are sometimes external to them, sometimes internal, is, is very important. Uh, family life development and support uh, should be one of our goals in, in, in most parishes. Uh, sometimes it can happen in indirect ways, by family events and uh, hosting parties where families can come together many, many ways. Uh, it doesn't have to be so much direct teaching. It has to be modeling. Mm -hmm. As we see families that are happy, this, this contributes to other, pe other families seeing that they too can be happy and they can resolve some of their problems and issues. So mm -hmm. when we get families together to interact, 
that is probably one of the best things we can do to support family life. Yeah. Well, you celebrate a big party every year for people who have been married right. uh, for anniversaries, right? And right, that, 25, that's, 50, yeah. it's uh, more, it's sometimes 60, 70. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful day. It's a really a, a very happy uh, celebration. Unfortunately, there's, there's fewer people coming, especially the people married 25 years. We don't, you don't see that many uh, people coming because they're not there. Yeah. So it's a shame. You know, the ironic part about this Divorce Expo is that they're offering a, a social get-to-know-each-other thing. So, I mean, there does seem to be that uh, innate, you know, yeah. wanting to be with one so another. People, do, it's, it's almost kind of a serial monogamy. People get married once, and they get married twice, and they get married <laughs> three times. They want marriage. They don't know sometimes how to pick the right partner, don't know how to make it work. Uh, we're in a society where uh, inconvenience and suffering are not part of what we learn. And as soon as something goes wrong, well, the, the, the highway, that's it. Sure. Well, a good teaching, a basic teaching of the church. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, thanks so much for You're taking welcome. the time to be with us today. You're welcome. And stay tuned. There's more Currents Ahead. When we return, turning away from celebrities for another side to married life. I think it comes down to preparation, that people don't take the opportunity before marriage to really prepare themselves and ask themselves the difficult questions and to realize and reflect on the fact that it is a lifetime commitment, but also it's a way of life that um, is very rewarding. And finally tonight, it's a story that is not going away quickly. It's the latest episode of the ongoing breakup of Kim Kardashian and basketball player Chris Humphreys. Humphreys has filed legal documents to force his estranged wife to reveal how much money the couple made from their wedding. Now this of course is not what most people expect when they decide to tie the knot. Celebrity style breakups and messy divorces are typically not the experience of most couples, but it's easy to get a distorted view of the sacrament of matrimony if relationships like that of Kardashian and Humphreys continue to make the headlines. Now around the time that story first broke, the Brooklyn Diocese Office of Faith Formation hosted a theology on tap to give people an opportunity to further explore the Catholic Church's understanding of the sacrament of marriage. People are here tonight for Theology on Tap, and we're going to talk about what the Catholic Church teaches about marriage. It's important because a lot of Catholics don't really know why we believe what we believe with the sacrament of marriage and uh, annulments. And Father Peter Papora works in the tribunal, so he deals day in and day out with people who are coming in with marital issues, and I think he'll be able to shed some light onto why we believe what we believe. Well, I think for many reasons, uh, marriage has been at the forefront. It's been in the news lately because of the passing of the same-sex legislation. Um, of news items like the marriage and then the, the breakup of Kim Kardashian. We had the royal wedding this year as well, so a lot of positive and negatives. Um, marriage has been out there. It's been a topic of discussion. I think there are a lot of people that, that don't see marriage as important anymore. They see it, let's just live together. What's the point of getting married? And I think marriage it's about God it's not just these two people they're making a commitment before God so it's during these modern times we should think that God is something that's it's stable it's the cradle of our society it's it's the underpinnings of our society if uh, if marriage collapses if marriage fails in in the United States or in the world um, we see uh, we see the breakdown of society these days divorce is so prevalent what's going wrong with society whether it's legally spiritually or what, what where where we're going wrong or what we could do better I believe that Kim Kardashian's failure at marriage kind of uh, epitomizes what we in America think of marriage as um, we kind of glamour it up and we don't put Christ into the situation our catechism states that God made us to love. He made us out of love, and we're here to love each other. And we should find that in marriage. I think it comes down to preparation, that people don't take the opportunity before marriage to really prepare themselves and ask themselves the difficult questions and to realize and reflect on the fact that it is a lifetime commitment and something that demands something of yourself, but also it's a way of life that um, is very rewarding and that you receive as well. But I think... Um, Whatever we might be facing, a crisis in marriage, I think has a lot to do with the preparation. 
it's, it, it's incredibly important to me to get the church's perspective and only the church's pr perspective because everything else is so warped that it's the only truth that's still available and again the only true reality of what marriage is about. I, I don't think anybody should ever put marriage down because while it may not be so for all of society in general, that's okay. As long as the couples that enter into it are solemn towards that end, that's perfect. And that is all for this edition of Currents. Be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also connect with us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Liz Faubless. Thank you for watching and have a good night.